everyone to uh, the Thursday DMICE Research Conference, which uh, we've been trying to have back in um, person, and we're working <laughs> toward that. Um, and, and actually, I could tell you, Lynn, that um, the EdCom person uh, just the, there's some decent equipment in here, so hopefully this should go well, and um, those who are online can uh, interact with. Um, uh, those of us who here, who are here, so it it gives me a great pleasure to um, welcome my colleague, um, Dr. Tanashi Matswangwa, who um, is from the University of Cape Town. And so you might wonder how um, I know Tanashi, and he and I are co-PIs on a grant. Some of you know this. Um, the NIH has an initiative called the Data Science Initiative for Africa that um, is aiming to um, build data science capacity in Africa and um, not only um, people capacity but also data capacity. So um, actually prior to that um, uh, prior to this project, I actually had a connection to the University of Cape Town in that I served on the scientific advisory board for another project called H3A BioNet, another NIH project, um, and H3A stands for Health and Human Heredity for Africa. Um, and that project aims to build capacity mostly around um, genomics and other omics. Um, so anyways, um, when this new initiative came along, um, we did what we all do. Uh, we wrote a proposal. <laughs> it got a good score, and we got funded. And so now we have this collaboration that is aiming to develop a new graduate program in computational omics and biomedical informatics at the University of Cape Town. Um, and what we contribute to the project, because our um, health and clinical informatics courses are online, um, we are contributing uh, courses that students in this program will be able to take. Um, and then also um, because of my experience in developing educational programs. And um, so last quarter in the um, Biomedical Informatics 510 course that I teach, there were actually seven students enrolled from the University of Cape Town um, in the course because it's an online course. And in fact, I happened to be in Cape Town in February and actually got to meet those seven students in person, which was fun. Okay, so then let's um, move on to our um, topic um, today. So um, Dr. Matswangwa is an associate professor at the University of Cape Town in, um, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And um, that is his... Um, formal training. Um, he's actually originally from Zimbabwe, um, but did all of his education at the University of Cape Town, a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, um, master of science in medicine and biomedical engineering, and a PhD in biomedical engineering. His uh, research area is mostly around imaging, which we'll hear about, and uh, it's great to see not only the DMICE imaging people, but other imaging uh, folks from around campus. So I will um, let him uh, proceed. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the platform. It's a great pleasure and thank you very much, uh, Prof. Hirsch, for the invitation. So um, I'll speak to you a little bit about um, medical imaging within the context that I'm actually working in. Some aspects may be a little bit different because we have different constraints um, just based on um, um, just um, um, <coughs> um, different resources that are available to us, but uh, some things may be familiar. Um, it's not too technical, at least not as technical as some of these things can be, uh, but if it does get a little bit uh, too much, please just uh, let me stop and then ask me some questions afterwards or during the talk. So sorry. Okay, so I have to do some promotion because that's how we do when you visit. Um, the University of Cape Town, uh, let's start off with where Zimbabwe is. So Zimbabwe is there in red now. South Africa is uh, just below Zimbabwe at the most bottom tip of Africa. 
Cape Town is at the corner of the most uh, uh, bottomless country on Africa. And that's where the University of Cape Town is. Um, this is our main campus, and this is what it, this is what it looks like. We're um, just on the side of a mountain, similar to what you, you guys have. Mm -hmm. um, and the mountain behind there is basically Table Mountain. So if you've ever heard of Cape Town, that's the Table Mountain. This part is not so much of a table. It's the other side. You would have to look at it from a different direction to, to see that, um, that aspect. Um, but formally, the, so in terms of information about the University of Cape Town, it was founded in 1829 as a South African college. It was established as a university in 1918. And um, in terms of enrollment uh, for students, it's about 20, plus or minus 27,000 students and 4,500 staff across six faculties. So we have commerce, engineering, and the built environment, health sciences faculty, humanities, law, and, and science faculties. So, because I'm in the Faculty of Health Sciences, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that faculty. Um, so, that was founded in 1912. We have about 500 and something academic staff, 11 academic departments, and about 4,000 uh, students um, enrolled, um, plus or minus 4,000. And one of our biggest uh, claims to fame, um, I'll talk about the imaging one later, um, is that uh, we are, we're situated next to Kritoskia Hospital, which is where the first heart transplant was actually done in 1969 by Professor Christian Barnett. In terms of my own background, as Bill said, I'm an associate professor in biomedical engineering, but my focus is in uh, medical imaging. I'm also an associated researcher at EMT Atlantic in France, and I'm the group lead of the Im Medical Image-Based Inferencing and Distributed Diagnostic Research Group, or Me Too D2 for short. <laughs> <laughs> so the Me Too stands for Medical Image-Based Inferencing, and our areas of research are imaging and image analysis, so, uh, analysis solutions for computer-aided diagnosis in resource-limited settings, <coughs> settings. And we use methods from machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, statistical shape modeling for this aspect. The D2 stands for Distributed Diagnostics, and our area of research here is in mHealth and telemedicine. And the technologies we employ are things like blockchain, x augmented reality. I will not be speaking about that aspect today. I'll be focusing mainly on the medical image-based inferencing. The group consists of one academic staff member, uh, with, that's myself, one junior research fellow, sorry, there's no S after the fellows, um, one, post one postdoctoral fellow, uh, seven PhD students and two master students. And in terms of um, the clinical areas that we're operating, at least the dis disorders and diseases, we focus on tuberculosis, fetal alcohol syndrome, cervical cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, osteoporosis, and a variety of other musculoskeletal disorders. So my talk today will be focused or more oriented on the musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, but I'll speak a little bit about our work in FAS and uh, tuberculosis as well in terms of medical imaging. A bit of a disclaimer. So I'll be speaking, I talk about low resource com, um, settings and I'm sort of conflating that with the rest of Africa, but I don't know much about what's going on in the rest of Africa, to be honest. I know things that are happening in my corner of the woods, <laughs> um, but I think a lot of uh, things do sort of, um, uh, the, the situations are more or less similar um, for the most part. Um, but yeah, just to say that it's, the, the, the presentation is biased towards my own context, and I have no disclosures uh, or no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest with the material I'm presenting today. So let's go to the imaging. What are the main imaging modalities? Well, you have X-ray, you have CT, you have ultrasound, and MRI. And we can broadly divide these into two categories, so 2D imaging primarily from X-ray and ultrasound, and 3D imaging from MRI and, um, and CT. So that's just to set, uh, uh, set a bit of a, of a framework for how I'm going to outline the talk moving forward. But before I, could, I go to, the, to those aspects, I just wanted to maybe highlight some of the innovations that have come out of Africa that people may not know, uh, and some of the innovation that's actually going on uh, today in terms of the medical imaging space. So the CAT scan is actually co-conceived by South African, um, Alan, uh, Alan Cormack, you know, together with Godfrey Hansfield, and they both received the Nobel 
Prize in Physiology in 1979. Um, in South Africa, we're also responsible for the development of the first full-body X-ray scanner. It's called the Lodox, um, Lodox Stat Scan. It's featured in Grey's Anatomy um, at some point in time. Um, in 2007, um, the Cape University, uh, University's Body Imaging Center was developed. So this was the first research-only imaging center, I believe, across the whole continent. Um, 2014, the UCT spin-off um, by a company called uh, Cape Ray developed um, in the Kessel system, which incorporates full-field mammography in automated breast, uh, breast ultrasound. And they have uh, gone on to patent this, and, um, and they're still conducting some tests, although I believe that they're being um, bought out um, by an American company. And then in 2015, 2017, Cubic got their first research-only or research-dedicated MRI and PET-CT scan. So I don't know if you had any preconceived notions of what it might be like in South Africa, but it's, this does not paint a really bad picture, right, if you just look at it um, um, at face value. That being said, Cape Town, South Africa, is not representative of the rest of South Africa, and it's definitely not representative of Africa. So... There are some challenges across the continent. One of them is access to advanced medical imaging equipment. In a study in 2013 by Molura et al., um, they reported that across the continent, at least in terms of CT, um, on average, Uh-oh, did we get lost? Looks like they got disconnected. That does. So, Lynn, is Mitch Carter the one from yeah. ITG that's running? Uh, yeah, let me try to dial them back in. I don't know why they dropped. Thanks, Mitch. Okay, okay thanks. Is disparity across different sectors. I, I think they had disconnected and reconnected. But, oh, okay. But now the question is how we get your slides back. <laughs> um, huh. Oh, well. <laughs> All right, Lynn, are um, you guys there? Yeah, let's. Um, trying to get the slides back. I can uh, head back in there really quick. Okay, great, thanks. Oh, you're back there for a second. Yeah, I saw that it said on the top that the call had ended. There we go. Okay. So it's worth noting that the WHO recommends that 90% of imaging needs of a country can be met by just a simple 2D X-ray ultrasound machine <coughs> per 1 million people, right? Um, but what we are trying to do in my research group is now reconsider what kind of information can we get from an X-ray or from an ultrasound so we can add some value where it would not be available using traditional 3D or advanced um, scanners. I like this picture a lot. So this is um, an artist, or is a photographer, his name is Johnny Miller, and he uses, this, uh, he uses drones to take images to show sort of like the disparities in different settings. This is from a neighborhood in Cape Town, and what you can see on the right side is a really densely populated, almost slum-like um, um, uh, neighborhood right next to a leafy, kind of sparsely um, uh, populated um, um, sort of um, uh, neighborhood. And uh, this is an artifact of apartheid, right? So there was a segregation or separation of uh, groups based on, 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 on racial grounds, and that is still largely uh, present um, in, in a lot of South Africa. 
So there's this divide here. It's not really there, but it's, it's kind of there, right? And in radiology, we have a similar divide. We have, you know, areas, well, could be different countries. It could be even within a country, different um, 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 sort of um, uh, neighborhoods, or it could be different uh, social economic, uh, people from different social, social economic status. So they have easy, there's on the one side, easy access to advanced equipment, and the other side, you have no access to the most basic medical imaging. So this has been termed uh, the radiological divide, and it's, it's been a really motivating sort of, um, um, it's one of the things that has motivated my research group and our research thinking the most, which is how do we bridge the radiological divide using tools that are already available in that space and sort of just um, adding value. And one of the good ways of doing that, because we're living in the age that we're living in, is of course leveraging machine learning and AI to do that. But in so doing, one has to be quite cognizant of like being too disruptive, um, because you're not gonna get a lot of buy-in by the communities or the clinical uh, personnel in the countries that you're trying, or the uh, areas you're trying to operate in. So our ethos, of course, is to, implement, uh, to focus on implementing products into existing systems rather than starting from scratch and replacing existing systems, right? We're always looking out for opportunities of what is already there, and then we try and make that better than trying to start something from, from scratch. Now, the blueprint for our research group is as follows. Um, we are trying to leverage, like I said, things that are already occurring, connect technologies that are already available on the continent. There are a lot of imaging devices which are in relative abundance compared to you know, the more advanced ones. There's been a large penetration of smartphones and uh, telecoms, uh, telecommunication network, uh, telecommunication, so let's, let's just say advances in telecommunications in Africa, um, which has actually shocked a lot of people. <laughs> Uh, considering that we leapfrogged uh, from, you know, having a, a dial-in phone straight to having a smartphone. Um, um, it's, 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 it's been quite um, a big jump. And of course, there's advances in machine learning. So we, uh, we loosely use this blueprint, uh, but it's basically trying to consider remote low-cost imaging. So if there's a piece of equipment that's largely available in the region, we want to see if we can use um, the fact that uh, we can transmit data quite easily uh, to a, maybe a remote, so to a central server and do some processing and then send back only what is required back to the clinician. And so please take note of this framework because I'm going to sort of superimpose all the research that we're doing on, on this framework. So let's start with our flagship project, which is 3D from 2D reconstruction of the X-ray. The motivation is that, at least for orthopedics, 3D patient-specific anatomic structures aid visualization and interaction with volumetric data. So it makes planning, uh, uh, intervention planning a little bit easier. It makes diagnosis easier if you have a 3D, if you have 3D data rather than 2D data. And typically, you get our 3D data from CT and MR, but these are too expensive for us to acquire, maintain, and to train personnel to actually use them. On the, other side, on the other side, we have in, relative, in higher relative abundance uh, digital X-ray and ultrasound, but they lack the detail that you would get from CT and MR. So the idea is, can we get a 3D-like structure from a 2D image in a way that it can be either diagnostically useful or it can be useful for surgical planning or prosthesis design? And we, we are focusing on CT and X-ray because there's a lot of trauma-related injuries, and um, so, so there's a lot of trauma in the um, in, in, in South Africa, um, and as well as you know diseases of the aging, as our population is also starting to age. Um, so why is CT better than X-ray? You know, you get a, a more comprehensive view with CT. Uh, like I said, interventional planning is easier with CT, and uh, you know, diagnosis can be easier in CT. So we follow uh, one of many approaches, but it's um, one approach that I think is, um, is, is, is showing to be quite um, promising. So if you're given a patient's 2D X-ray, right, you would want to figure out how can we 
um, get the 3D uh, reconstruction just based on that. It's very sparse information. An X-ray is a projection image, so really getting 3D information directly from that is very difficult. The way we go about it is we actually have a 3D prior or a template. This 3D prior is actually developed from uh, st um, statistics about the populations that we are uh, aiming to intervene for. So um, it's parameterized, um, and basically what we're trying to do is do an analysis by synthesis um, approach. So we're trying to analyze a 2D image using a 3D model. But because we have a 3D model, we need somehow to uh, get it into 2D space, at least the state of the model when we sample from the model into 2D space. So we somehow have to uh, create uh, a synthetic X-ray of the current state. So this one is a morphable model, it's moving right now, but the movement there is basically um, um, just different states of this model, right? So for each state, what we want to do is project the current state into 2D space. And we can use some metrics to compare the synthetic X-ray and the real X-ray. And if they, are, if they are similar, then we can say whatever state the model was in when it generated that 2D synthetic X-ray is the 3D reconstruction. If they're not similar, then we have to go back into our model and then we have to find another um, yeah, another state, right? So then we have an optimization loop. If you want to read a lot, a, a bit about how we're doing this, we have this paper in the um, IEEE in using biomedical engineering by my PhD student, uh, Cornelius. So what we have then is three modules, actually. We have a module which does the modeling, then we have a module which does the synthesis, and then we have another module which is doing the optimization. If you look at the literature, a lot of people combine all of this into one project, so you might see one paper trying to do this, but we want to do it in a way that it generalizes beyond just simple use cases, so we split it into three PhD projects. So let's look at the modeling part. The first part of the modeling module is actually work that I did at EMT Atlantic when I was a junior chair in, medical, uh, in biomedical imaging. And to, to get the model, what we do is we take patient data, CT, segment that data. Here we're focusing on the scapula. We do a, a rigid alignment of all our training data and we do a non-rigid registration. The non-rigid registration helps us to establish dense surface correspondence um, between our training sets. Once we have dense correspondence, then we can do statistics on each of the corresponding points, right? So, here I'm showing on the right hand side, it, it looks like just a, a normal 3D model, but of course the 3D model is made of many, many points, right? Now, each one of those points is in correspondence across the training data. That's what I mean by dense surface correspondence. Then our training involves just some sort of compression. We, talk, we typically use a prin uh, probabilistic principal component analysis. And from there we can sample from our model. And now we have a model that's generative. So here it's generating. Uh, on the left, you will see the first principal component, the variation in the, in the population um, for the first principal component and second principal component. But on the right, we're just randomizing the shape parameters and creating basically virtual sort of scapulae. So these are like virtual patients, right? And the idea is that somewhere in that shape space, in our statistical shape space, there could be a representation of a, patient, a real patient's shoulder uh, blade. So if you want to read more about that, you can find an article. Um, so it was a featured article in the Transactions of Biomedical um, Engineering. But my PhD student, a uh, former PhD student now, uh, John, uh, wanted to do something a little bit more general. The idea here is that, okay, we can do it for shape, but what if we want to leverage the information, the intensity information in the image? Because that's a good proxy, for example, for bone density, so for bone quality. So we now need to think of a way of combining the statistics of shape variation with the statistics of intensity variation. But what if we don't want to do it for just one bone? What if we want to do it for a joint? So then we need to now incorporate pose variation. So that's a variation in pose at, at, at image acquisition time across our training population. So conceptually, it's, it's easy, but in terms of actually doing it, it's non-trivial, but we have, we have a solution. 
So for a mod training example, we can take multiple features. So the features that we're looking at are shape, intensity, and pose. So we have shape features, intensity features, pose features, and we have to put them in the same statistical space. For pose, because pose is um, pose variation does not is, is nonlinear, you have to um, you have to do a little bit of trickery. So we have to project that into a manifold. But after doing that bookkeeping, you can combine um, all three um, features, um, the variability in all features in the same statistical space. And we encode the, vari the variability as deformation fields. Then we use a Gaussian process um, as our, um, uh, our compression. Uh, so a Gaussian process is just a multivariate distribution over functions where um, the function here is the deformation field. And that gives us then a generative uh, model where we can sample from that. Here I'm just showing how you sample from that. You still have to do a bit of bookkeeping to make sure that the pose is extracted in a useful way. But it allows us then to be able to have new joints, new joints that are not in the training set uh, and that could be representative of a patient. And so here's an animation. Um, this is from real data. It's from, I think, 40 patients. Uh, it's a model developed from uh, training data of 40 patients of the shoulder. You can see that um, the joint, you know, we can sample different orientations uh, for the humerus, clavicle, and the scapula. And the intensity here, just to, for it to be easy to visualize, is just red and orange, uh, red and blue, where red is more dense and blue is less dense, right? We're sampling quite far from the mean occasionally, um, so it's a normal distribution, our model is a normal distribution, and when it's far from the mean, then the intensity and the, the joint space also starts to look a little bit odd, because basically we're saying it's an unlikely scenario under the distribution that we are looking at. But close to the mean, like about a standard deviation or two, we can say largely this is kind of what you'd expect to see in, 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 in the population that you are trying to model. 40 patients is not a lot. You obviously would want to do that for a lot more if you want to get more representative data. But here we're talking more about the approach and in subsequent work, um, you know, we've added more data. If you want to read more about this, it's an um, the Kai paper, and also more recently in the journal on medical image analysis. The module two is an X-ray synth synthesis. So how do we get from our three D space to our two D space before we do the comparison of the patient's X-ray? And basically, what we do is we use the same technique that's used in video game generation, which is ray casting, right? Not again. Yeah, I'm disconnected. Disconnected too. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. There's probably some network error that keeps kicking it off. You dial it back. Okay. Thank you, Mitch. Just on, on that because we have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we have a, a 3D model, we have a way of also projecting our model, and this, can, this is done in real time. So we have our, 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 our digitally reconstructed radiograph rendering engine is GPU enabled. We can model different ge uh, imaging geometries um, because we expect that we're going to see different geometries when we look at different machines. You know, we've got fan wind geometries, you've got, um, what is it, uh, just no more projection, et cetera. And our renderer can also, using second order statistical methods, we can decide which areas we want to actually render. And that might be more useful, for example, if you want to fit a bone in parts, like maybe the trabecular bone first and then the cortical bone, sorry, the cortical bone first and then the trabecular bone, which is, you know, kind of, if you like, really, what are you modeling there? Because it's, depending on the image quality, you're not seeing much. Um, but you can at least cascade how you do your fitting by fitting separately and you get a more and more precise uh, solution. For the optimization, I have another PhD student who has worked on this. And the idea or the one of the 
uh, primary desiderata for our uh, solution was to make sure that we can model the uncertainty in our reconstruction. Um, I don't know if there are any clinicians yet. I know Bill, you're a clinician, but if you tell people that you've done a reconstruction, they probably want to know what is the error that you they can explain. What is uncertainty in the reconstruction, right? Given that this problem is very ill posed. So the, our approach is to use Monte Carlo Markov chain. Um, it's a sampling-based approach where the idea is to get the full posterior distribution of our model given the observed data. And so that posterior distribution is actually the uncertainty that uh, in our fitting. Here I show, it's gonna be very difficult to see, There's a, this is for contour fitting of one bone in 2D, where the model is black and then the target is white. And you can see that just using the sampling-based approach, we can actually get a good fitting. And just because we had the ground truth here, I can show you what it looks like in 3D. So that's actually the model in black being uh, fitted onto um, uh, the target. This would not be, this would not okay in real life. You would not have the, um, the, the ground truth, of course. If you want to read more about that, you can find that in the Shape Me um, workshop at Mikai 2020. In terms of clinical applications, um, I have a student who is working on how can we use this for something clinical, um, a pilot study of sorts. And the idea is to be able to actually use this type of approach uh, for 3D uh, <coughs> bone density estimation for, osteopor uh, for osteoporosis screening. So osteoporosis uh, basically um, um, occurs when you, know, you start losing bones, bone density, and that can be for a variety of reasons, including advanced age, um, disease, uh, medication. In South Africa, we have a high a population, we have a large population that is living with HIV, and they have to take antiretrovirals, and antiretrovirals make your bone density decrease. And there's also breastfeeding. So the idea is to use this approach to fill this onto 2D X-ray. Now there's some detail that I'm missing here. So if for my image, our imaging colleagues, you might be like, oh, how would you know what the density information in the image actually is? Um, because, you know, it's an X-ray. You need some sort of way of understanding what the household, that what intensity means um, in terms of real density. And so our approach is to actually use a phantom would be in, in clinical, in a clinical, when it translates this clinically to have a phantom, an imaging phantom, which gives us a reading for what the intensity in the actual X-ray is. Um, we've also tried to have faster inference instead of the MCMC approach, which is really good. It gives us a nice, a nice uncertainty estimation, but it is really slow because it's a sampling-based approach. And so using an encoder-decoder network, we can actually do faster inference and get our reconstruction. And then in order to actually start looking at soft tissue, um, also being able to reconstruct some soft tissue, we're trying to uh, leverage um, differentiable rendering so we can have an end-to-end -end, um, system um, for 3D from 2D reconstruction. So that's really leveraging the power of, of, of deep learning um, to do a little bit more than just looking at both. So that's... That's 3D reconstruction from 2D X-ray. Now, in terms of how it aligns to our blueprint, we would imagine, or you can imagine, a remote clinical site where they have a digital X-ray, and you would want to then give them some information in 3D, uh, which might be helpful for whatever reasons that they might want. You would, they would securely, we would have a provision for them to securely transfer their patient radiographic image data we could do our processing remotely uh, and only send them back maybe a diagnostic result, a 3D visualization for planning, a fracture type, or whatever um, information that they need. So that's really distributing the imaging, um, and that's where the distributed diagnostics comes from. The benefits for a resource-limited setting, it's cost-effective, it's accessible, um, this approach, and uh, you know, there'll be also the idea that you use less radiation um, for because you're using X-ray rather than CT. So for people who have compromised immune systems, this might be a useful approach, or for pediatrics, right? Um, and obviously, 
a big benefit is the time and cost uh, efficiency. So they, uh, this, this approach would be faster and less expensive than CT or MRI. But this would only work in a very narrow scenario uh, situation. So we're not saying that this approach can and, uh, gets, uh, removes the need to have those other equipment. We're just saying we're in the scenario where we can't get those, what can we do with what we do have? So that really should be, uh, should be said. But let's look at looking at 3D from reconstruction for 2D images, which are natural images. Um, so am, I, am, am I doing okay for time? Um, yeah, it's, um, it's 12, 12 away. So. Okay, all right. I'll go a bit faster. Mm -hmm. So here we're trying to look at fetal alcohol syndrome diagnosis using images. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome uh, basically occurs uh, where it's what's due to prenatal alcohol exposure. It's a big problem in South Africa, and that's mainly because during apartheid, um, in the wine growing regions, uh, farm workers used to not get paid in cash all the time, but sometimes in wine. And so there's a cult, there is a, a culture that's been sustained even after apartheid ended of, um, of drinking heavily, particularly during weekends. So um, the, the, the the thing about FAS is if it's diagnosed early, you can intervene early and therefore the outcome is better. Um, but there are challenges. In South Africa, we don't have many dysmorphologists, so it's very difficult to do large-scale prevalence studies in remote regions. Uh, so they need uh, maybe a computer as, um, oh, a, a computer aided diagnostic agent to help with their screening. Um, indirect anthropometry, is quite accurate, so that's using digital images uh, um, to take uh, to to do the analysis. But because the areas, uh, well, the measurements that you really want to take for using the face, uh, which is the most distinguishing or discriminating um, set of features amongst you know the the, the rest for fetal alcohol syndrome, I mean, they are also neuro uh, cognitive, um, neuro neuro developmental issues and growth retardation, but the facial features, at least the constellation of facial features, is the most discriminating. So we focus on that for the diagnosis. But the, the, the type of uh, measurements you want to take are, you know, from a 3D person. You're trying to simulate what a dysmorphologist would do in 3D. And so doing that on a 2D image, even with a, with a, a scaling marker, is, is still missing the mark. But there's also a missed opportunity to look at the face as a whole instead of just focusing on only on these areas that dysmorphologists look at, particularly when you start thinking about um, um, the fact that um, some of the, uh, the criteria for the facial shape analysis has been developed in the global north, and we don't know if it directly applies in the global south, right? So we want to keep our options open. So 3D imaging is the way to go, but 3D imaging is extremely costly because you need a 3D scanner. So here we're trying to do uh, 3D from 2D reconstruction and see, can we get really good geometries just by analyzing uh, a 2D image using our 3D from 2D approach? And this is work in collaboration uh, with the University of Basel, um, formerly, but also now with uh, <coughs> Frederick Alexandra University um, in Ellingen in Germany. And it's called an analysis by synthesis loop. So it's very similar to what I said for the X-ray, but here we're doing it for natural images. And the idea is you have a morphable model, it's parameterized, so that's what's on the right. One set of parameters is for shape, the other one is for texture, uh, which will be capturing you know, things like skin tone, et cetera. And so you're trying to find the parameters that are descriptive of your image, right? So if you see on the left here, you have your input image, that's at Tom Hanks and Maybe I have to start it again, just so that it's easy. You have an image of Tom Hanks, and you put your model in, in, in the, oh, you simulate um, an analysis, and then you try and find the right parameters for Tom Hanks. And at the end of it, you have that representation of him, which is a 3D model. And they've used this primarily, at, at the Basel, they use this primarily for perception understanding. So it was not focused on the geometry. Whereas if you want to use it for fetal alcohol syndrome, you need to focus on the geometry. So the work from my uh, former master student of mine was to actually see, can we actually do this and see how accurate the geometric, um, the, um, geometric measure is, uh, geometric accuracy. And what we found in our um, 
you know, assessment is that you know, we can actually get reasonably good geometries from this approach, but we can do even better um, maybe by adding another perspective. So instead of asking the clinician to use just one picture, maybe getting two, a profile picture and, uh, or two 45 degree pictures or a profile picture and a frontal picture. And that definitely helps. But this was just a pilot study to see if the approach would work and we're not using um, um, a population of children with fetal alcohol syndrome. So next step is to actually go and collect data and show that this can work to capture for fetal alcohol syndrome. If you want to read more about that paper, you can find here. So how does that align to our uh, blueprint? The idea is if you have a smartphone, you can then use a, work, a healthcare worker in, uh, at a public school in a, in a rural area can take a whole collection of images and then we can, in a similar way as before, um, transfer the, the data, do a reconstruction and flag for, um, for whether that uh, subject need, or that patient, sorry, needs to be, um, to go for the full battery of tests. So it's not gonna be a diagnostic tool, it's gonna be a screening tool um, because we just don't have enough resources for um, our, um, our dysmorphologists to, to, to go to all these schools. Um, and the benefits are largely similar, so I'm not going to go through them. The last thing I'm going to go through is improving latent uh, tuberculosis infection screening. So TB is a respiratory disease caused by myobacterium tuberculosis. It's a leading cause of death by a single infection, infectious agent. And in South Africa and Africa generally, sub-Saharan Africa, we have a disproportionate, um, well, TB is a big problem. Um, now, most people, when they're exposed to TB, if you're not immunocompromised, you know, you may not, you may not actually get um, an active TB, you might just get latent uh, TB. Um, but given that we have uh, populations that, um, you know, for people live with HIV, et cetera, whose immune systems are compromised, um, that becomes a big problem. So we have a lot of people who have, uh, we have a lot of um, issues with LTB becoming active TB, particularly in dense in, 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 you know, in the slums, let's, let, let's say like that, We're in densely populated regions. <laughs> that being said, of course, uh, it's, uh, there's preventative therapy for, for MTB and you can cure LTB and, and, and prevent um, progression to LTB. But the idea here is to try and do the diagnosis as early as possible. Um, and so I'll go through the sort of standard uh, of care for so the standard clinic um, screening approach in South Africa, which is the Mantu tuberculin skin test. Although we are more and more also getting um, egress um, in, in, um, as part of the uh, of the screening uh, chain, but egress is, uh, is a bit of a logistical nightmare because then you have to take all the samples back and, and all that stuff. So the the test, the Mantu test is still the predominant test, and I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. In fact, I think there are even more skin tests um, that are coming along. But I'm not in that field. I'm, I'm in the medical imaging field, so don't quote me. So how does it work? Well, you inject tuberculin in the patient's, in the subject's forearm, and after 48 to 72 hours, an injuration develops, and depending on the size of that injuration, which is measured rather crudely by a pendant ruler method, it's been like that for years and years, um, depending on that size, you can decide, um, and, uh, and a bit of the patient's history, you can, you can say something about whether or not they have LTB. So if a patient is living with HIV, they might have a different classification in terms of the size of the injuration that's required for a positive risk. One of the problem is that um, for the boundary of the injuration, because some, sometimes the injuration is really subtle, <laughs> so you have to palpate in order to get the edges, but the boundaries are always really subtle. So trying to use an image-based approach is not helpful, but even for clinicians who are using a ruler and pen method in darker skinned individuals, we actually observe a lot of intra-observer error. Repeating that measurement is not, um, you know, even with lots of training, is uh, you don't always get good um, repeatability. So that's one problem. The other problem, of course, is the 48 to 72 hour period between the um, application and the reading. Um, so for a variety of reasons, uh, 
patients may not come back for that reading um, because either it's too far, uh, they don't have the money, they have conflicting um, priorities like work, etc. And if you don't get that evaluation within that window, then that invalidates the test uh, results and that, you know, you miss opportunity to, uh, to give treatment and, and it impacts the screening and surveillance. So you don't really know where, where the, 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 the LTO, which, which areas are, we should focus our resources on, basically. So we've come up uh, with an approach. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the part before I show you the latest version of that approach. But the first approach we tried was 3D reconstruction of the induration based on a smartphone image. Uh, we developed an application um, that would guide the user to so it would be a self-administered test. So they would just scan over their arm and then it, it would use time of flight to do a 3D reconstruction of the induration. And then we could like compare with you know, the standard pen and ruler, which is the ground truth in this case. Um, but that was proving very difficult because our GP imaging is not really good at capturing the extent of the induration. It becomes more difficult for darker toned individuals. So we needed an approach that would actually look subdermally and see if we can actually see if that reaction is something that um, has some features that are, <laughs> uh, that are um, that you can image using some imaging technology. And we went for hyperspectral imaging. Now you might be saying, uh, if you're gonna use a hyperspectral camera, we, ha we have one there, it's, it's extraordinarily expensive. How does that work in a low resource, uh, low resource setting? Um, it's kind of defeating the purpose. But what we have rationalized is that we actually want to use a hyperspectral imaging to develop a classification framework um, and characterize indurations uh, because we can see a lot more with hyperspectral imaging. But concurrently, for every patient that we're imaging, uh, we are also taking an image with a smartphone in, uh, using the RHP. And then the idea is once we get a good classification or characterization framework with hyperspectral imaging, we can use transfer learning uh, to transfer um, um, that classification framework for, for smartphone images. And then we can then, in, in terms of deployment, just use only the smartphone. Our results are promising, and my student, our PhD student, has just submitted to me there. So, in terms of the blueprint, it kind of is kind of similar to everything else. It's remote. Uh, it could be uh, a self-administered uh, test, which would be ideal, and that 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 removes this 42, 48 to 72 hour uh, issue. But it could also be applied by a healthcare worker in a district where you know you know that at least from the perspective of getting a consistent reading, we have removed the bias and the subjectivity from the pen and ruler method. So yeah, the benefits are largely the same. Um, of course, these are, these are research projects. Um, and so we have to think a little bit about the path to implementation. There are lots of things that we have to take care of. None of these projects is mature enough that we're doing large scale clinical trials. Um, but some of them are, some of the projects are involving uh, clinical patients. For example, the TB project, we're actually uh, piggybacking on another study where they're um, applying um, the TST to a lot of people and uh, a lot of healthcare workers who are working in, 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 in areas of high prevalence of TB. And so we're getting a lot of data from, from these. And so far, the results are looking promising. The other ways of, of, of bridging the radiological divide, and some of them are through capacity building, and that's a kind of linked to what me and Bill are, are working on. Um, so in terms of training and education, I'm involved in a lot of um, initiatives across the continent um, in terms of uh, teaching AI and, 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 and things of that nature to um, students across the continent. Have, um, oh, our group has a uh, a growing list of collaborators. We're in um, discussions with um, a, a, um, the Lodocs um, Private um, Limited who, are, who developed the first full body uh, screening tool to see if we can incorporate some of our technology into their devices. The work that I'm doing has been funded in part by um, you know, the National Institutes of Health, uh, South African National Research Foundation, Swiss, Swiss Nest. National Foundation, the DFG in Germany, and um, our, our French partners. And 
we also I also try to advocate uh, in you know sort of to lay people you know by giving mm -hmm. TED talks and talking about how we can bridge the divide. Bill may have already spoken about this, um, but um, we have a joint project um, sponsored or oh, funded by the National Institute of Health as part of the Data Science Africa Initiative. We're trying to develop a two-year master's, four-year PhD, and faculty training program, leveraging our respective expertise. This is the team. Um, we have uh, Bill, um, then uh, Prof. Mulder, and Dr. Mendu, and myself as part of the leadership. Those are our stated aims. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, so um, we have um, some time for questions. We um, have people here in the room, or um, we can't see the WebEx very well, so if there's like questions in the chat, um, someone's going to, either the person who typed them is going to have to speak up um, or someone's going to need to read them. <clears throat> but any questions? For, yeah, Alex. Thanks. That was a really terrific talk and uh, very interesting. Uh, I guess this is, um, I mean, at the root of this, one of the problems seems to be data acquisition, how you get sort of the ground truth in the places, be you know, rural areas or places that are so you know, underserved, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so how do, you, how do you think about sort of the biases and the training data sets as you go forward? Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you think about capturing, I guess, a heterogeneous enough uh, population to, to yeah. serve as a, a training set for this? So, that's a very good question, and I, I don't know if my answer is going to be satisfactory at all. <laughs> but one of the things, at least, because I come from the world of working with statistical shape models, and we've always understood in that community that getting a representative data set is an issue. So what we always try to do is match our application to the demography that we are actually working on. So our applications are always very specific and very targeted. Trying to scale that up to, you know, um, something like a system where you're trying to get representation across a whole region, um, at least a whole, you know, province or something in South Africa is, is, is going to be difficult. And South Africa is a really, really heterogeneous uh, population. <laughs> so I think in my mind, and, and I don't mind to confess this, I've kind of pushed that problem a bit further whilst I work, we worked on the tech. Uh, we feel like that's something that is a discussion you have when it comes to implementation, but the, 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 the technical things that you have to do in the background, at least for the majority, you can do by abstracting away that problem. And then when it comes to, okay, now we actually want a clinical solution, then you really have to think, okay, now I need a representative model. So that's one way of doing it. The other way that we have, have been doing it is to maybe try and uh, have bias mitigation uh, strategies that are more technically grounded, like copular component analysis and stuff. So, you know, sort of factorize out different uh, confounders based on any of um, the secondary information we are getting from our patients so we can make our models more agnostic. But I don't know how that scales. So I, I, I'm sure that's not satisfactory, but... <laughs> that's what you got, right? <laughs> Yeah, th thank you for that. That was really a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. So in terms of resources, uh, you know, there have been some really uh, impressive innovations coming out of Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, limited resources often challenges you to think about things differently, which I think is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us a little bit about the infrastructure for sharing images and what the opportunities are for maybe getting access to all images that have been collected and Mm -hmm. what those barriers might look like and yeah so I can talk about data sharing generally because I think it's informative um, and Bill maybe can weigh in um, part of what we're doing uh, as part of um, this um, data science Africa initiative is just <laughs> opening up avenues for more data sharing generally um, and I think that there's a big drive for that. Um, uh, I think there's maybe some hurdles around, you know, sort of different, um, what is it, 
politics in different countries and stuff, but these are things that can be overcome. I believe the will is there. Um, and so that, 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 that's just general information. In terms of from our particular work, we are as open as, as possible, but I don't think we have the numbers that people might expect. Um, and that is a bit of a problem. Um, recently, we just um, um, we spoke to the head of radiology after many tries to try and open up the PAC system so we can actually really start doing something um, a little bit more, you know, mm -hmm. um, well, to start really validate whether this approach is actually work. But in terms of the data that we have imaged ourselves, and I, I don't have any issues, you know, with, with, with an agreement in place to, mm -hmm. to share that kind of data. In fact, that's what we want. Um, and I can tell you that myself and a collaborator at the University of Basel, we've actually started a, a platform, an online platform, um, which is called uh, Shape the World. It's a bit tongue in cheek, it's about shape modeling. The idea is to put um, all these models on this platform that are already developed and validated so that other people don't have to go through the growth pains that we went to. And also to have a platform where people can discuss methods for um, how to build applications on top of these um, this model. So I'm as open as in, in terms of open source as as possible. Yeah. And, and you know the the DSI Africa project, you, you know, which is NIH funded, is um, you know it's the, there's all there's many facets of capacity building. You know, there's human capacity building, right. there's data capacity, there's also infrastructure. So they're negotiating ag agreements, you know, just like NIH, you know, even here and, you know. It's, uh, yeah, and, no, it's, it's a real barrier for yeah, well. yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's a lost opportunity, right? Yeah, because not yeah. having access to data. Yeah, so getting some of the cloud providers to, um, um, uh, you know, provide space, you know, in their cloud for. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think some of the barriers that we've seen yeah. that are, are just is at the institutional level and uh -huh. yeah. all these cultures within the yeah. institution when it comes to sharing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, to <laughs> but really worthwhile when you've yeah. got innovative models and, and that real drive. Yeah, we certainly have. Yeah. You know, there, there's another NIH project. I was just in DC yeah. earlier this week called Bridge to AI. And the uh, at least for now, the the big cloud providers, you know, Microsoft and Google are chomping at the bit. You know, they want to, you know, I'm sure they kind of see the long range benefits to them doing it. And hopefully they won't, you know, at some point pull the plug or whatever, but um, that they've been very, you know, amenable to, you know, providing capacity. Sounds good. Do we have any, <clears throat> any questions or comments from the WebEx? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Okay, well, it's actually just about time. So um, um, I want to thank um, Tanashi for giving this talk. And, and as one who's actually not an imaging person, I, I found it very um, understandable in terms of, of what you're doing. And I can see a lot of the clinical correlates. So, uh, so that's great. And, um, um, you know, and Maybe going forward, now that we have this formal collaboration with the University of Cape Town, there might be some opportunities to uh, collaborate in other ways besides our initial educational one. So thanks again, and um, thank you all for coming. And then um, we'll um, pause for about 15 minutes, and the 